I'm uh, Itzik Pear. I am at Columbia University in New York. Uh, my primary affiliation is the uh, Department of Computer Science along with the Data Science Institute and the Department of System Biology. But uh, most importantly now, it's, uh, it's great to be part of uh, CGSI. And uh, I think it's important to give credit to Zara and, and uh, uh, other co-organizers for uh, creating this venue and bringing this community together. Uh, so lots of thanks to all organizers and uh, staff and, and volunteers for, uh, for making sure we're having such a great time. And uh, also, uh, thanks to all of you for creating, for being part of this uh, community. And given that this is the um, morning session of the fourth day of a conference, just thank you for being here. Uh, you have already uh, exceeded expectations. Um, and um, no matter what, uh, what's your actual excuse for, uh, for being here, uh, it's great that, you're, that you, you are. Missed hmm? You missed one day of the conference. Missed one day of the conference. We're five days, five But this is the fourth day. Wait, you're very optimistic. <laughs> um, all right, so slide two, and I already have a big mistake. Uh, this is going fine. The, um, um, so um, I know that many of you are doing uh, statistical genetics, uh, and even if you're not doing that on a daily basis. Here, you have been hearing about this on a daily basis, or I uh, assume many people are at least conversant. But uh, just to uh, make sure we are all on the same page, uh, in, uh, in human genetics, we study the diploid genome sequences of different individuals. And uh, these sequences are 99.9% uh, similar to one another. Uh, but being the divisive people that we are, human geneticists focus on the differences and um, don't look at anything else. Um, also, um, there are two kinds of people, and we're the kind who would convert things to uh, zero and ones. And uh, once we do that, we have our uh, matrix of data of uh, different individuals sampled uh, different individual samples, uh, for each of which, for each of whom we have different features, and we can do all the standard things that uh, that you do with this. You can analyze each column, regress a phenotype on it, get a genome-wide association study, um, or we can identify principal uh, components of this matrix, like uh, John November and others have done. A, or we can focus on th these clusters, or rather a soft clustering of a, the individuals, and identify what's known as the structure, capital, uh, all, all caps, a, of, um, a, of the population. Now, it's no wonder you can a, do all these things, because these are the things you typically do when you get a matrix of data. You try to. A, come up with a, a model that uh, approximates your observations, and uh, you compare and contrast the model to the observations. You, uh, this allows you to fit the model and learn some in basic insights, or to identify deviations from the model that identify particular things that, that have gone wrong. And this is true not only in the context of uh, human genetics. Um, uh, taking the bird's eye view, uh, a large fraction of, of genomics in, in general is doing these kind of things, uh, both 30,000 and one half. All the numbers here are approximate. Um, the, if you're doing evolution, like the uh, previous talk, then, um, then you're considering different, uh, different sites across different, uh, different species. Um, or if you're doing a microbiome, then 
again, your samples are different individuals, and the features that you measure are the different quantities of, of different microbiota. Um, um, or, and similarly for gene expression analysis, you can, um, uh, you can model the quantities of different gene features across different human individuals or single cell uh, uh, organisms or single cells within human individuals. Um, what, uh, what we're going to do in this tutorial is actually look not at modeling the data itself, but, but rather look at the relationship between the different rows. So we're, uh, we're taking the, uh, the, secondary uh, the second order analysis approach of uh, considering the relationships between pairs of individuals. Uh, most straightforwardly, uh, you can think of that as a, as kind of a dot product that would give you correlations between uh, between different samples, and if it's if there's one thing that one can take home from this tutorial to your own field, to your own domain, is to really think explicitly on the tension between uh, between primary modeling of directly the data observations versus uh, the the higher order. Um, analysis of relationships between, uh, between data points and the way these relationships can be defined. So um, straightforwardly, if you consider the, uh, the similarity between different individuals, the naive thing that you can do is just measure similarity, as in the dot product, how, ask how many uh, of the if sites are actually identical, that's identity by state. But a, the real focus of, a, of this tutorial is a different measure of identity, identity by a descent. And we're going to now a, soon define that, a, see how we can detect identity by descent, and how, these, how method, methods for that have, have been developed over the last decade. Um, as well as ways to um, use identity by descent and leverage that for practical purposes in uh, both medical and population genetics applications. So, so what's, uh, what's identity by, uh, by descent, or IBD? So the uh, identity by descent really relies on the, the fact that when we're comparing two a current copies of the genome or, or just single chromosome, because we want to think of just a single linear a, entity. A, it's wrong to think of them as completely unrelated, because we're all a, somehow related. And if you, a, if you think of the ancestral pool of chromosomes from which a, all the chromosome 17s of people in this room have been uh, derived from, well, uh, each of uh, um, each such chromosome is a mosaic of these uh, segments that are drawn from this uh, ancestral pool of chromosomes. And if you compare my chromosome 17 to Iran's, then um, we, might, uh, we might be uh, lucky enough to have uh, the same segment for both of our genomes being drawn from the same ancestor, in this case, the yellow ancestor, in, in which case that segment would be identical by descent, by virtue of its common uh, ancestor, um, and, and um, barring the, the very recent mutation events, would be completely identical. So um, the um, trying to be a uh, more formal about this, it, it, it makes sense to look at uh, only uh, at this effect generation by generation. If you consider uh, these two uh, founders of, uh, of a pedigree uh, with sibling cousins, second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, the um, individuals in this pedigree would have uh, segments of their 
chromosomes drawn from, well, these four colored chromosomes as well as a, other things from, a, from other individuals who, who mate into the pedigree. And uh, after these, uh, these um, five generations, um, we might see this blue segment coming from this ancestral um, great, great, great grandmother um, that is identical by descent between these two uh, remote relatives. Now, um, um, most people don't know relatives of them uh, of theirs more than five generations apart, and and this actually uh, and this actually makes a sense when you when you try to be more quantitative uh, about uh, about these relationships, um, because when you're looking at, at siblings, well, siblings share half their genomes, and uh, the the half uh, the half that's being shared is not just independently drawn at each site, but rather segments are inherited till the site of the next recombination. So uh, the shared segments uh, are on average 50 centimorgans in length. That's, in, and that's very, very long. Uh, and every additional generation, on the one hand, reduces the overall fraction of the genome that's shared by a factor of four, but uh, also, um, it, because of recombination that uh, trims down the, um, the um, uh, ancestral chromosomes that are being inherited along these two lineages, uh, because of these recombination events, uh, the actual segments that are, uh, that are being shared have an average length that's uh, shorter and shorter. So the more, the more meiosis Event, uh, events, the more recombination events you have along each of the, these lineages, and the average length that's being shared uh, is uh, proportional to the uh, average, it's twice the, 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 the length to the next recombination site, because we're looking at the next recombination site to your right and to your left. left. And uh, that's inversely proportional to the number of recombination events that separate the two uh, remote relatives. So after, uh, uh, after k generations, uh, we, uh, we have an expo expo exponentially small average fraction of the genome that's being shared. But what is being shared is shared in, in long chunks, because the chunks decrease in length only linearly with the number of generations. Now, um, it, Nora Rosenberg and others have uh, made the, the, the distinction between uh, segments uh, that are uh, that one can think of as, as very long. Uh, by very long, I mean 10 centimorgans or 10 million bases on average, and and more, just to give people a scale, sense of scale. Um, when individuals um, uh, when individuals uh, are really relatives, so uh, less closer than uh, than fourth cousins of one another, then they typically share such long segments, and they typically share several such long segments. You can you can uh, do the arithmetic of the length of the genome and figure out that this this is what you would typically expect. So these are. Uh, these are familial segments of identity by descent uh, that uh, you would see when you're looking at pedigrees. In contrast, when you're looking at a, a somewhat shorter uh, lengths uh, of segments and longer uh, uh, lengths of time till the common ancestor, um, if we're talking about these medium lengths, in segments, uh, these are typically coming one per uh, uh, ancestor, uh, but uh, but pairs of individuals would typically share an ancestor if they have uh, a, have a shared history over the last uh, say hundred generations, which would typically mean 
uh, having some kind of a shared population and often multiple lines of uh, shared ancestry. So uh, you'd have one segment per ancestor, but potentially uh, multiple segments between, uh, between pairs of individuals due to same, uh, same ancestry, but multiple ancestors. Same ancestral pop historical population. Uh, when, you, uh, when you go uh, further back in time, which corresponds to, uh, to shorter and shorter segments, then um, um, segments that are shorter than uh, at the scale of hundreds of uh, kilobases or, or even less are beginning to approximate more and more the, uh, the direct comparison of the genomes uh, and the measure of identity by state. It, these correspond to more ancient similarity measures, more ancient relatedness uh, at, the, uh, at the level of uh, whole continents or intercontinental uh, similarity. Um, so, um, so these segments um, can, be a, it can be pretty long uh, still. Um, in order to detect them from data, we need to, uh, we need to uh, uh, do considerable work, uh, depending on the technology, depending on the amounts of data that, uh, that we have available, depending on how clean the data uh, may be. And the, uh, the first, perhaps more straightforward uh, approach to uh, finding identity by descent segments in a cohort of multiple individuals would be to consider pairs of individuals, the uh, first pair, second pair, and a third pair, first individual, and third individual. And a, one, can, a, one can try to find long stretches that are completely identical between a pair of uh, copies of the genome. You don't really have those between these two individuals. But uh, these, the second and third individuals here, uh, really have a very long tract. So everything is identical besides the first and last site in this cartoon example. Uh, and if you, uh, if you conducted this comparison, you'd be able to, um, uh, to detect those long shared, uh, shared substrings. Um, when you're trying to do that more formally, this translates to having a probabilistic model uh, over, every, uh, uh, over the similarity of uh, sites and sequences. And uh, the hidden Markov model that ensues uh, was first applied in large scale uh, for, for SNP data uh, by uh, Sean Purcell and the popular uh, uh, Blink software package. Um, when you try to scale the, uh, the analysis to more and more individuals, the uh, HMM-based analysis on every pair of individuals becomes less and less compelling. And we've heard a, a talk yesterday about the, uh, the very large scale of current, uh, current data sets. Here, uh, uh, an important uh, tool introduced by uh, Sasha Gusev, now faculty at Harvard, um, is uh, the analysis of segment by segment along the genome across all individuals. And for each segment, you can list the k-mers, the, uh, the different combinations, the haplotype combinations that you, that you observe within that segment across the different individuals in the cohort. And if you create a giant hash table for each such, um, such a segment, you'll find the areas of the genome where, it, where you have a joint hits within the hash table. So uh, these two individuals, these two first individuals would uh, hit the same 1010 word uh, in the hash table. Same key uh, for the second and the third segments, and you'd be able to at least start the process of um, uh, of identifying IBD segments, circumventing the need for a full-fledged uh, pairwise analysis of every pair across every, uh, every site along the genome. Um, 
the, um, a, so Brian Browning was talking yesterday, but uh, a, uh, a more sophisticated approach is really based on the, the, um, the Beagle graph that, um, uh, that identifies different states, dif different haplotype states across different individuals and uh, different positions. And when you're looking uh, in this graphical model, you're able to find, uh, to map each individual, in this case the, the yellow-black individual, to this path along the model, the brownish, light brownish uh, lady here, to another path and yet a third path here. And using the path structure, you're, you can more efficiently and effectively detect um, the collision of, uh, of paths along a uh, considerably, considerably long stretch, which uh, by definition implies a identity by, a, by descent. Um, the, um, this, there are other further um, abstractions, for instance, uh, um, so treating the configuration space uh, of the uh, membership of different groups of individuals at, a, a dif a, at different uh, nodes here. Um, but really, uh, uh, something that all these methods share is that a, there's a struggle here between treating uh, individuals as individual copies of the genome uh, as, uh, versus treating individuals as they are, which is diploid samples. So two copies of the genome that uh, are distinguished by phase, which is at least initially uh, unknown. So uh, obviously if you've, uh, if you've developed your phasing and you've done that accurately enough, so knowing the phase of the data is, um, is remarkably helpful because you can treat the data as individual copies of the genome. Um, but uh, phasing is a hard problem, and especially if you want your phasing to be, a, a, to be accurate for very long stretches, the length scale that's relevant for identity by descent. Um, so, well, uh, uh, while phasing is helpful, it's not, it's not trivial to assume that it is a, a always available. Um, the converse is also true. If you have identified stretches of identity by descent, uh, you can use that information to help your phasing. So uh, a trend that is now uh, becoming uh, becoming more and more prevalent is to integrate both a phasing as well as a detection of identity by descent in, within uh, the same framework implicitly or, uh, or explicitly and um, achieve better results for, uh, for both these tasks together. Um, the, um, so, um, well, there are lots of um, continuing challenges as we uh, have sequencing data sets that, uh, uh, that change in quality between regions uh, and increase in scale from a court of a single lab to a consortium that's uh, based uh, uh, in multiple places. Um, the, um, uh, the ch challenges for detecting identity by descent uh, continue and, and uh, with uh, additional advances that are addressing these difficulties. Um, it's important at this stage perhaps to, to switch gears and to see what we can do once we've detected uh, those segments of, uh, of IBD. How do we use them uh, both for analysis of the structure of populations as well as for medical genetics applications. So uh, when, thinking, uh, uh, when thinking about genetics of populations, um, the, um, 
Uh, it's helpful to think of uh, the population as a cartoon of the current generation that's derived from the previous generation, that's derived from the previous one, previous one, and so on. And uh, in this cartoon example, we have uh, a demography of a fixed population size of 20 individuals. Um, and in this, uh, in this cartoon example, one can trace back the ancestry of, of each single copy of the genome. And whenever two such copies would hit the same individual, it would have identity by, uh, by descent, very recent or less recent, uh, depending on when this event of coalescence of lineages had occurred. Um, if the population had been smaller, then these, uh, these coalescent events tend to be uh, more frequent, and the, these lineages tend to be uh, shorter. So in this cartoon example, we have a smaller population size and a more recent uh, coalescence. Therefore, uh, we would see longer segments of identity by descent. Um, for many, uh, as, as a reminder to people who are, uh, are less on top of uh, coalescent theory, it, the, the probabilistic model for describing those lineages and the way they coalesce um, is based on the assumption that's not really realistic, is that which we choose our parents. Not only do we choose our parents, we do so, uh, we do so randomly. And um, uh, when that happens, we can formally write the chance for two lineages to coalesce because they would randomly choose the same parent. The, um, if the uh, effective population size, uh, the number of individual, the number of breed individuals um, is known, then the chance for such a coalescent event is uh, uh, the inverse of that, uh, that population size. And um, that would mean that if we repeat that process generation after another, then the number of generations that it would take till we hit this coalescence event is a repeated coin toss uh, with a success or a success rate of one over a and e, which means that this time is geometrically distributed with a, with a probability of success in, in one over any. Um, the, um, the coalescent models are very flexible. You can think of populations that are not fixed in size. Um, for instance, a population that uh, has an ancestral size here of five individuals, then within uh, three generations expands to to current population size of 20 individuals, and a, the, a, a somewhat related model would ensue, a, still we're following the same principles. And theory for that has been a, well developed starting the early 90s with a, a Kingman and, and Donnelly leading a, many of these efforts. Um, and whenever we have such a, a, an expanding population, uh, obviously, when uh, at this bottleneck, when the population had been very small, many of the lineages would tend to coalesce because they have a much higher chance to do so. Um, trying to do that, uh, trying to uh, more formally think about uh, identity by descent in the context of coalescence, we can uh, think of a model of the population and parameterize that model by, say, the, uh, the number of individuals, if we have a fixed population size, um, or by the parameters of the population expansion, if we're thinking of a linearly expanding population. And, uh, and given such a model, we can ask questions about particular quantities. For instance, one quantity that we can uh, that we can measure is given an arbitrary site, a random site along the genome, uh, 
what's the chance that that site, that particular individual, is within uh, a, a segment of identity by descent of a particular approximate length. So of a length L that's between some U and V. So we need to integrate the, uh, the probability of uh, seeing a particular length L uh, given the set of parameters theta. How would that, um, um, how can that be computed? Well, we've already seen that um, the, um, the lengths of a coalescent, uh, the length of a segments of an entity by descent heavily depends on the number of generations still the common ancestor. So let's break it down and integrate uh, the, uh, the probability for seeing a length L for any particular number of generations k. Now we can do that for each k uh, separately and um, and and this, uh, this expression now has two, uh, two independent uh, components. The chance of uh, observing coalescence uh, within k generations, and coalescence theory uh, gives us that. In the most simple case of a uh, fixed population is a, a, a using the, a, the geometric distribution in more, more complex models with other uh, closed forms. Um, and the probability of observing a particular length, given that we know these individuals are k generations apart. We also know that because, uh, because it, the, uh, uh, this length is the distance till the recombination site on one, ha on one direction plus the distance till the recombination site on uh, the other direction, so that's, uh, so that's uh, sum of two exponentially distributed variables. We know the distribution that's an Erlang 2 uh, distribution. Um, and for particular cases, we can, uh, we can substitute an, uh, the, the, known, uh, uh, the known quantities and, and get closed forms. For more complicated uh, scenarios, we need to, do, we need to work a bit harder, but we can compute these, uh, these measurable properties, these uh, probabilities that we can estimate from data. Um, the uh, other, uh, uh, other properties besides the chance of a particular site being within a region of particular length is just the overall distribution of lengths in the uh, in the particular cohort, again, given a, a model for history, the overall number of segments within any, any particular length bin, uh, and the total um, fraction of the genome that pairs of individuals are, uh, I, are predicted to share, uh, expected to share, or the distribution of that number uh, across the sample. Um, you can do that for single populations, for, uh, for models of increasing, uh, increasing complexities. For instance, uh, a population here that expands a, and a, has a population bottleneck and then expands again. Or you can consider uh, models that rely on parameterization of multiple populations. A, in this case, uh, an ancestral population that a, that splits up to two distinct populations that have some migration rates uh, between them. Um, all these provide us with, uh, with a likelihood model for the distribution of particular, uh, particular measurements from identity by descent in, in the cohort. Um, which means we can uh, fit a model and draw particular conclusions, uh, either uh, regarding um, uh, regarding the path demography or other parameters of the data. Uh, for instance, work by the Price Lab that uh, that inferred mutation rates from uh, from uh, differences across segments of identity by descent. 
the, um, um, so all these, uh, so, um, so we, um, all, uh, the, and then the kind of things that you can do uh, may be appreciated by going through a, a particular example. <laughs> this is a particular data set uh, of about, four, uh, about 500 uh, uh, individuals from the Genomes of the Netherlands uh, project. Anybody Dutch here? Uh, so you might identify the different uh, areas here that uh, at least to begin with uh, uh, didn't mean much to me. Uh, but the, um, um, the, um, a, a, the data includes about 500 individuals who are trio parents, which means we, ha we have data of an offspring that's not used in this analysis, but is helpful to phase the parents. So we're looking at, a, at a, about a thousand phased copies of, a, a, of genomes across 11 provinces. And a, one can, a, for simplicity, partition them to, a, to north, south, and, and center of the Netherlands. And if you consider the, the a, average number of a, segments of identity by descent between random pair of individuals from one province and another, you get this kind of a, a similarity matrix. Um, what can you see here? Well, uh, not surprisingly, if, if the uh, provinces are ordered approximately from, from north to south, then in nearby provinces are more, rela more ancestrally related, and most of all, the diagonal is, is stronger than anything else. The chance of having an ancestor from your own province is higher than is then from a more geographically remote area. Now this is, this particular matrix presents the data for a segments of identity by descent that are seven centimorgans or longer. Um, so the average time scale that we should have in mind when, when interpreting this matrix uh, is, uh, is about the 16th century. And when we go towards shorter and shorter segments, that corresponds to going back in time to earlier and earlier centuries. And as you go to, uh, uh, further and further back in time, what happens is that the, there's more mixing between, between the different regions. And um, for segments that are one to two centimorgans in length, the main thing you see is no longer the diagonal, but rather the, uh, the more, uh, the larger similarity between individuals within, uh, within the north versus within the south, corresponding to the overall um, uh, migration history of the Netherlands. So this is sort of the broad picture, uh, but something that, um, that you might have missed uh, when we went through that was that um, in this particular, uh, at this particular time point, uh, the, uh, during the eighth century, um, we see some, uh, we see an outlier here between two of the provinces that are, uh, that, that are more related to one another than, than one of them is to itself. So this seemed, um, had it been somebody else's data, this might have been an error. But um, the, uh, when we uh, <laughs> um, investigated, uh, when we investigated further, um, we we realized that um, that uh, the um, uh, well these two provinces today are uh, geographically distinct. Uh, that's a result of a, of a great flood uh, at. Uh, at that point in time uh, that um, obliterated the land bridge that provided access between these provinces. So uh, at the time, um, these provinces were actually ancestrally related, um, in, in suggesting uh, a reason for this, uh, for this particular outlier. 
So, um, popular genetics is great, and we learn a lot, uh, and curiosity is really the driving force of all of us being here, but also we want to apply that, uh, uh, the insights that we have to, towards the greater good, and uh, see how it helps medical genetics as well. Um, there are several, several direct implications of a identity by descent very briefly towards medical, uh, biomedical investigation in genetics. Um, one, uh, one very clear application is uh, the opportunity to enhance the quality and, uh, and density of the data that we have. Uh, consider a uh, data set that's very cheap per sample nowadays of a genotype data across many individuals, and genotypes are sufficient in order to identify many of these segments of identity by descent, especially uh, the longer ones and in, in large cohorts. Um, that means, in turn, that we can sequence only a, a, a small fraction of these samples and get for free the, uh, the sequence content of um, many other samples, many other copies of that of that segment. Um, so um, in some explicit or implicit sense, imputation of genotype data really relies on, uh, on identity by descent. And the longer the segments that you are able to recover, the, uh, the better the similarity would be. So uh, the more pristine your imputed data uh, would become. Um, Similarly, one can, one can consider data that, that's not sparse, but thin or shallow. So low coverage data can be enhanced by using identity by descent information as evidence to improve the calling of these of variants that you don't have lots of direct read observation for. Um, a different in a different direction to, uh, to use identity by descent segments uh, is um, association testing. So one can uh, consider the segments of, uh, of identity by descent in, in cases versus controls or to correlate the presence of a particular segment with a quantitative phenotype and get something similar to a uh, GOS Manhattan plot, but based on um, identity by descent segments. This is, uh, this is part of uh, chromosome 16, where the, uh, the wax, the strength of association uh, log, uh, uh, log probability score as in standard um, uh, GOS analysis. Um, the, uh, the idea is that if you have lots of segments across a data set in all your samples, well, uh, you, can, uh, you can go uh, segment by segment and cluster the individuals by, uh, by segment and use that cluster membership as a genetic marker. Um, the... Um, the a translation of those, um, those uh, secondary connections, the relationship between, between pairs of individuals to the entire cohort is then a uh, locus specific graph of relatedness where a particular locus, a particular haplotype that's shared between all individuals corresponds to a click, and there have been lots of work uh, by, by Zarn and others uh, to identify these clicks uh, very rapidly. So um, I think I'm just about out of time. Um, so just to sum up, the um, um, identity by descent is a measure of similarity between individuals that is not, not really scalar because it has a scalar entry for each time uh, uh, for each point in time where it's measured. So uh, it's a time sensitive measure, if you will. And you can use that to, uh, to draw inferences both in terms of the um, 
the structure of your samples and, and the populations they're made of, as well as in terms of biomedical applications for, for association. You can do all that, provided you do the work and detect that problem. Thank you.